and welcome to the big show. This is Dim Lights and Stiff Drinks, Dive Buyers of Seattle, the podcast of dingy taverns, back alley saloons, gritty roadhouses, and dive bars of the greater Seattle area. We explore the seedy history and salacious backstories of timeless drinking establishments, along with sampling what's on tap and swapping tall tales. We hang out in the places where sorrows are drowned and future regrets are made, so you don't have to. But we don't just talk about this awesome dive bars in the confines of some cushy recording studio. You can hear from the music. <laughs> no, we're that's here. Right. <laughs> we come to you live directly from Seattle's greatest watering holes. But before we get into that, quick word from our sponsors for season four. Dim Lights and Stiff Drinks, the dive bars of Seattle, is proud to be sponsored by the Stedman Group. The Stedman Group is a local independent business that owns and operates Targi's Tavern, profiled here in Season 1, Episode 9, The Pogi, Season 2, Episode 12, The Duval Tavern in Duval, and Larry's Tavern in West Seattle. All of us here at the podcast are pretty tough critics when it comes to how the local dive bars are being run, and we have always been extremely impressed with all the dive bars owned by the Stedmans. This is because all drinking establishments, especially those that have been around for a while, each have their own unique character and charm, and it's obvious when you walk into a Stedman's bar that you are devoted to maintaining that tradition. And for that, we raise our glasses and cheers. The Stedman Group, committed to preserving the legacy of dive bars throughout the Puget Sound region. All right, we're back. And with me, as always, is the Dim Lights crew. Bob, producer extraordinaire. How we doing? Noted historian and celebrity author Brad the Stash Panda. Hello, everybody. Sweet M. Meth and Lou. Here getting fancy mixed drinks. Oh. <laughs> uh, and Switching I'm it up this week. <laughs> That's yep. right. It's not about uh, the taps I'm where we're host. at this week. I'm your host for this episode and this week. Um... You know what? I'm, I'm going to reuse one because I think it is completely apropos for where we are today, tonight. Yep. MC Swizzle Stick, right? And we're actually going to get into why a Swizzle Stick for tonight because uh, there's a whole, it's a whole thing going on. It makes sense to me. But we yep. are here at Diller Room in downtown Seattle, kind of the central district. And uh, Fred, why don't you give us a little bit of, bit of info about where we're at? Yeah, like you said, man, we're here at the Dill Room, which currently operates as a popular downtown cocktail bar. This bar is known for its Cocktails fancy... Cocktails with swizzle sticks. With swizzle sticks. It's known for its mixed drinks, and apparently it boasts the largest whiskey collection in, in the Pacific Northwest. At least that's it's what huge. it says on its uh, website, and I believe it. It's huge, and we got some pictures yeah. we'll post on the socials for sure. Yeah, yeah. This is the type of bar you go to if you're kind of having like a special event downtown... Maybe you have some time before that event starts and you want to get a fancy schmancy drink. This is your place right here. You want to hit the happy hour with your uh, C-suite guests from out of town. Yeah. 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 Uh And I'm sure people are hearing this going, well, that doesn't sound like a dive bar. (laughs) And you're right. It's, It's definitely not a dive bar. But, you know, I just want to remind listeners, our repertoire includes historic drinking establishments. This is a drinking establishment. And it's rich in history. And you can look around. It's not a, everybody's not dressed like Mr. Peanut with a monocle and a top hat. (laughs) Yeah. It's a a Seattle crowd. It's a Seattle crowd. We're We're all in our flannels and everyone's wearing their jackets inside and their ball caps. uh, But you don't roll into here expecting a $3 well drink. No, 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 no. You know. This is downtown Seattle. This is downtown Seattle. Throw one in front of that three. It's a little more upscale than our usual haunts, but uh, yeah, you're going to find some characters in here for sure. It's downtown. It's kind of like in in Seattle's version of like the financial district or something, you know? Yeah, Yeah, it's a good way to put it. We're we're not quite to Pioneer Square. We're not to the market. We're kind of in the middle zone if there is a financial. Well, you were here kind of scouting out the place last week, Lou, and the the report back from you was like... (laughs) Six o'clock. It's overrun <laughs> by, you know, downtown professionals uh, enjoying yeah. some happy hour. I came in at three, and they said, "Oh, Rob, our owner, would be interested. Come talk to him at five. And it was a totally different place at five. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was yeah. shoulder mm-hmm. to shoulder, packed. Music yep. was cranking. People were screaming to get over the music because so they turned the music up, and it was on. It was on. And it so, was hopping. So we're talking about like why it qualifies for a dive bar podcast, and it totally does. 
But Brad, you mentioned this. There's some pretty, pretty amazing history of this joint. That's one of the reasons why we're here, right? Oh yeah, it's yeah. an historic drinking establishment for sure, and it puts the history in that. So as most are aware, the Diller Room sits inside the historic Diller Building, which started out as a hotel. And as we've covered before, you know, you have the Great Seattle Fire of 1889, all the city's wooden buildings burned down to the ground, and afterwards all the city planners and developers and, you know, businessmen congregated, and they had the epiphany of like, okay, maybe we should rebuild the city in something a little more fire-resistant than wood. And with way more brothels. <laughs> yeah. So they started building, rebuilding the city in brick. And this was actually one of the first brick buildings to be built. In fact, it opened as the Diller Hotel exactly one year to the day after the big fire on uh, June 6, 1890. That's uh, incredible. Yeah. yeah. And this wasn't the only project going on. There were like 20 buildings, oh, 100 no, was, buildings going up at once. It was on down here, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. It's a pretty big space, too, so it must have been quite a hustle to get this place done in a year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess there was such a hustle to build all the buildings at the same time and build, you know, rebuild the city that they actually ran out of bricks and they had to import a bunch of bricks from Japan. So apparently a lot of the, the buildings down here in Pioneer Square were built with Japanese bricks. Cause, yeah, very well The good stuff. The good stuff, yeah. Now at the time when it opened, the new hotel was regarded as one of the city's most luxurious hotels with such amenities as running water and toilets. So that's pretty fancy schmancy. <laughs> right this da. way, your yeah. lordship. <laughs> yeah. uh, it also had the city's first elevator, which I thought was kind of cool. Very cool. cool. So the hotel was owned by its namesake, Leonard Diller, who ran the business until his death in 1901. At which point his widow took over ownership, and I believe it remained in the Diller family for like the next decade or so. Now, when the Diller Hotel first opened, as is, is the case with most hotels, it had its own bar. And where we're currently sitting right now sat the Diller Bar. It was the hotel bar for the Diller Hotel. Yes, yeah, so adjacent to the lobby, right? Like, like you, you the walked lobby, through yeah. the bar to kind of get to the lobby. Yeah. And there's nothing too noteworthy about the Diller Bar when it operated. It was your typical hotel bar. You know, hotel guests would mingle and drink and socialize here. But nothing too noteworthy happened. Fast forward to 1916, when Washington State went dry and Prohibition started here. Speak easy in the back. Yeah? Well, uh, so the Diller Bar obviously couldn't legally operate anymore. So that shut down. And in its place opened the Atlas Laundromat. It was a laundromat here that operated in the space. Yeah, laundromat. We that, as would later be revealed, the laundromat was a front for a moonshine operation. They were actually using the laundromat to, to, to manufacture moonshine, which was kind Those of... Those washtubs are great for gin. Well, it was right. kind of an ingenious <laughs> idea, and here's why. Okay, so when you make moonshine, you're basically following the same method as like how you make whiskey, right? You start out with a mash, the mash ferments, and you know, different whiskeys use different kinds of mashes, moonshine, the, the possibilities of what mash use are limitless. The mash then ferments, they extract the alcohol through the distillation process, right? Distilled spirits. Well, that's what moonshine is when it's distilled and it comes out, white lightning as they call it, that's what moonshine is. Whiskey is then put in charred barrels and that's where it gets its flavoring and its color from. But before it's put in the barrels, you basically have moonshine. Oh, we're going to have like some like whiskey and bourbon aficionados calling us out on all sorts of shit. I'm oh, sure. Well, technically, you got to, you know, whatever. There probably are little technicalities well, to We're that. talking moonshine here, people. We're talking moonshine. <laughs> this is like, get, get it done. <laughs> but here's the thing. When you're, the moonshine process, when you're do, going through that whole process, it can create like some really strong odors depending on what kind of oh, mash you you're think? using. Yes. Tons that, of fermenting. Uh, tons of fermenting. The mash gets all gnarly mash. and stuff. And a lot of the urban distilleries, that's how they got busted, because the cops would just trace the smell. Kind of like a marijuana grow operation. Oh, yeah. Almost. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the yeah malt, you can smell it. barley, big you time. You can smell it. Yeah, and, and when we recorded the episode in Pie Place Brewery, you could, you could yeah. smell I mean, they, That's they true. still brew in yeah. that building, and you could totally smell it. You could it. smell it. Yeah. Well, that was kind of the, in, the genius of using doing it in a laundromat, because the laundromat creates its own odors to counteract it. Ah. Plus, you probably got industrial fans and stuff, so they kind of mask the odor. Plus, think about it, 
you have a launder, uh, money laundering. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, if exactly. the cops were smart, though, they'd just make a beeline to that Febreze scent. <laughs> yeah, I'm like that's that's yeah, that's a red flag right there. Yeah. So by all accounts, too fresh. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Too all accounts. Hell yeah. <laughs> too fresh. Yeah. When you had the chains, the two chains. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So anyway, stick. Swizzle Stick. <laughs> Swiss, MC Swizzle Stick. Yeah, so the laundromat was selling, like, making tons of moonshine and then selling on the streets. Now, here's where it gets a little dark. At some point in the mid-20s, what a lot of um, kind of, like, more the unscrupulous kind of moonshiners and stuff would do is they realized they could buy large quantities of denatured industrial alcohol, which was legal to buy at the time. Used for like rubbing alcohol and rubbing medical alcohol, supplies. Rubbing alcohol, hand sanitizer. Medical uh, uses and shit. Perfume. Sure that, it's delicious. So yeah. Cologne. Yeah. But yeah, it's essentially rubbing alcohol. They were buying big, huge quantities of it. And then they were putting all kinds of shit in it to disguise the taste. They would then pour it in actual whiskey bottles and then, you know, cork it and then sell it on the street as though you were buying actual whiskey. That's when all those people went blind, right? Yeah, that's when a lot of people... When it got even worse at that point. So the government at some point realized this was going on. So they started putting in toxins and poisons in the man, the manufactured denatured alcohol to Just deter so people, people from doing drink. it. Oh, yeah. Oh, my but, God. But the people that were making whiskey this way, moonshine this way, didn't care. They just continued to sell it on the streets. And that's when people started ending up dead. And at some point, the laundromat here stopped making actual traditional moonshine and started making this fake, like, poisonous whiskey instead. Wow. Oh. And yeah, it's not, not a good business model when all your customers start dropping like flies. Yeah. Well, and there were a lot of newspaper articles about guests at the hotel suddenly falling sick and having to, like, be rushed to the hospital, a lot of them dying from alcohol poisoning. And I I'm, think it was because of the uh, indoor plumbing in the toilet. Yeah, <laughs> just uh, people couldn't handle it. <laughs> it was too much for me. The elevator. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they got like, motion sickness from the elevator. That's yeah, what it was. Yeah. But yeah, they were drinking this like gnarly poison shit that the laundromat. I think the laundromat changed owners at some point. At some point, they started out making actual legit moonshine, and then they switched over to the, the fake stuff. Well, yeah. You, you know, I, I don't, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, Brad, but people could write books and books and books about, like, the toxicity that, that was going on during Prohibition, right? It's like, yes, there were, there were bootleggers and moonshine and all the illegal stuff like you've written about many times. But there's also, like, a whole history of itself of, like, people dying and getting sick because they're And a lot of it was is, from this like, denatured alcohol yeah, that was being sold on the yeah, and, yeah. and uh, as well as stuff that's brewed that God knows what the fuck is in it and made people, like you said, blind and sick. And stuff. Oh, yeah. There's a whole whole history about that, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. People were making their mash out of all kinds of just gro like trash, basically, yeah. and then making alcohol from it. Well, at some point, a bellhop at the Dillard was arrested after he sold some, uh, some of this moonshine to undercover cops. Oh. And then, not too long after that, you know, they, the threads started unraveling, and they busted the laundromat, and it closed down. Mm. But it was from this bellhop. Now, a few years ago, this is where it gets interesting. So a few years ago, apparently, the current owners of the Dillard room that we're here at now had some kind of plumbing problem happen and there was a pipe burst under the floor. So they had to call a plumber in, and they had to actually like cut through the floor to get to the burst pipe to repair it. And when they did, they uncovered this huge opening with crates of moonshine. Oh, and, like, nice. And like old antique bottles. No yeah, what entire this? crates. This was just a few years ago. Holy like cow. three or four years ago. Holy cow. Yeah, and they uncorked one of them. Ooh. And they oh. said it just reeked. They smelt. They said it smelled like turpentine. Yeah, turpentine. What, which tells me <laughs> that, that might what have they been the covered, poison. It was the poison stuff. Because here's the thing: like hard alcohol doesn't go bad. Like wine can turn on you. If you open a bottle of wine and set it on the counter for a week or so, and then try to take it, sure, oxidation, oxidation yeah. basically turns into vinegar. Yeah. Hard alcohol, no. You, you could open a 75-year-old bottle of vodka, and it's going to taste just like it tastes when it was bottled, right? It doesn't go bad. So the fact that they even better this stuff, <laughs> even better, it smelled like turpentine. Triple for it. Yeah, it tells me that they got, they uncovered like the poisonous, toxic stuff. But but what if the aging like mellowed it, and it was <laughs> actually quite delicious? Did anybody yeah. taste it? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't know. encourage anybody to uh, take any taste. Those I, that did 
That's right. <laughs> At somewhere in here, apparently, they have a couple of these bottles on display. So yeah, my advice is of, uh, if you visit the dealer room and someone offers you a drink from whatever wherever these bottles are, that you politely decline because I, I don't if, think it's good. If you ever sign up to be like a plumber's apprentice and they're like, "Hey, uh, kid, to try one of his bottles uh, before we fix these pipes," <laughs> just pass. Just pass. pass. Yeah, hard yeah, pass. Just pass. Hard pass. So, in addition to the infamous laundromat, there was also a brothel that supposedly operated upstairs. All right. So, as far as the building itself, after World War II, the hotel went out of business and became an apartment building. And around the same time, the laundromat, which had long since closed, was repurposed back into a bar at, known as the Flamingo Room. So, like late '40s, '50s, for several decades, it operated That's as the Flamingo Room. That's a good name for a bar. That, that is a good name. That's going to bring a call yeah. back to some people. Someone who's probably like, "Oh yeah, the Flamingo." My well, dad used to go the there. Rat Pack earlier, uh, like the Flamingo oh, yeah. Room. You could totally picture. The Rat Pack, you know, yeah, rolling the in. Flamingo in Vegas. Yeah. Uh, in 2009, the space underwent a new series of renovations and uh, operated under a new owner and opened as the Diller Room, which is what where we're at today. Uh, and if you look around, well, kudos, you can see yeah, kudos to those owners for taking it back, taking it to the roots yeah. of the history, right? And re- well, we see this that. time and time again. Absolutely. You know, people, someone comes in and realizes its original potential and charm, and they want to bring that back. God bless the new owners with the with the vision and the history. Yeah, God bless them. Cheers to them. Yeah, and if you look around, you can see they kept the original kind of grandeur of the place intact. You know, Chandeliers. Like right above us, you got a crystal chandelier. All the beautiful, like, original stained glass windows and stuff. And an brick epic, work. absolutely epic bar and bar back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. a Brunswick bar. Epic. It is a Brunswick. Yep. Yeah. There's a Brunswick here. Incredible hard, hardwood, like, oak and all, like, the stain yeah. and patinas with the big, huge mirror behind it. It's it's truly classic. No, this is a beautiful, beautiful place. And, again, it's a far cry from the usual dive bars we're at, but... I mean, it's it's amazing where we're at. It's, it's you know, we'll, we'll allow it, right? Because we've been to some pretty great places. We've been to at least three places with true Brunswick original bars and bar backs. Yep. And the really cool classic mirrored with the top shelf, the blues and everything. Yep, yep. So, it's like, you know, it's a... Uh, right yeah, we'll, we'll allow it. Well, and then the owners, what is super cool about this place is not only did they keep the historical place of this room intact, but they added kind of local history. So right above us is the original sign for the Brooklyn that operated next to the Columbia building. The original sign is right there. Ditto for in the front room, you got the original turf sign. Oh, yeah. It says turf oh, cocktails. Yeah. And, you know, anybody that went to the turf back in the day, which was, what was it, on 2nd? Like 2nd and Pine? It was originally on 1st. It was originally on 1st. And then it moved up to 2nd, but it was, you know, Pike right there. But then it was on 2nd and Pike. But I mean, when you when you talk about a divey place, the turf like embodies <laughs> dive. Yeah, the little, the little teeny bar in the back, the teeniest of bars. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. At 6 every morning. <laughs> but even if you went in for breakfast and didn't even visit the bar, like you saw some characters sitting at the counter best, eating their best characters, yeah. best characters you can imagine. Yeah, like definitely kind of embodied old Seattle. So there's just cool little yeah, things if you look around the place. The, big Brooklyn sign on the other wall here, right? Like the original Brooklyn, which was like two blocks away. When when it closed a few years ago, it was pretty hoity-toity and fancy. Yeah. Awesome, delicious steakhouse. They had amazing oysters and stuff. Yeah. But way, way back in the day when they first opened, they were pretty freaking seedy. And it was like essentially restaurant version of a dive bar. In the, in the best way possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that place had some history and some stories for sure. It had some grit under yeah. its fingernails for you know, sure. You, as you're saying that, Brad, you know, looking around, especially with the tufted vinyl yeah. leatherette yeah, uh, that upholstery we're that we're sitting on, yeah. totally reminds me the of the high back boots. Vito's yeah. up on oh, First Hill. Yeah. yeah. Right? R- Which R- just R- closed. That's right. R.I.P. Yeah. R- yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. They, they yeah. reopened and then reclosed, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, they the last had, couple months, I want to say, they closed hope, good. But yeah. They were a COVID casualty, but good news is for a lot of um, thank you, COVID, for rising interest rates and prices going of supplies going through the roofs. There's a lot of construction projects on hold. So things like the water wheel mm-hmm. was supposed to be gone, mm-hmm. They're going to be there a couple more years. Get a little reprieve. stay of reprieve, yeah. 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 Um, Let's go visit point. them while you can. Burger Master in New Village, same thing. That was supposed to be Gonzo. And oh, are they still open? Yeah, they're open. They got a. 
Yeah. They got a while going. We're good. Are, are, uh, are they still actually operating? Like, yeah. you can still get food there? Yeah. Oh, nice. I thought they had closed down. Well, there's a there's also a Burger Master on Aurora. That's usually the one I go to. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah the one by the, uh, what is it? The Oak, Oak, Oak Tree. Oak Tree, yeah. Oak Tree Cinema. Also an old school place. So, yeah. So, if you're looking for, um, as far as the dealer room, if you're looking for an historic place to enjoy a drink, but want something a little maybe classier than, say, the Merchant's Cafe or Jules Maze, then I recommend you check out the Diller Room. What do you guys think about that? We think that's good stuff. Yeah. In fact, uh, we were just speaking about owner Rob taking care of the Absolutely. business. And uh, Rob, you want to come over here and get on the mic? Yeah. Step up to the mic. Thank <laughs> you, sir. We've got a special guest on the Don't pod right now. Back there. Owner Rob and is here. Well, first of all, we appreciate you coming to see if we wanted a refresher on our drinks. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. In a weird way... <laughs> It's my job. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, nice. W- with that, before we get into our guest speaker here, do we want to take a quick break for round two? All right. So we're, we're back for round two, but before we get into like what we're drinking, let me introduce a great guest that we got with us, and I'm hoping could actually tell us what we're drinking and give us a little bit of history and lore, because it's there's some pretty, pretty great stuff. So with us is uh, Rob Wilson, owner of Diller Room. Howdy, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. So we did a little bit, we talked a little bit about the history of the Diller Room and mm-hmm. where you have come into your ownership of the property and the way that you've managed and converted them and we talked a little bit about uh quite a few bars that we've been to that have an amazing history that have kind of come about full circle due to uh owners with the vision right so people who come in and recognize the history and embrace that history rename an old bar that's been named you know five or six times over the past back to its roots the diller room right so Welcome to the podcast. Really appreciate yeah, it. And uh, we're going to talk maybe a little bit about what we're drinking. But off mic, you're telling us a little bit about the history of some of the the. Uh, well, let me ask you a pointed bar. question. Uh, not as much as honoring the history of the Diller Hotel. You're taking care of the other bars. Like, how do you get the Brooklyn sign, which is here, <laughs> and the <laughs> Turf sign? We're just talking about that. Where do you find old signs? Yeah. You know, I. It's like. Uh, I was thinking at the end of that movie, um, oh, uh, The Departed. The yeah. Departed, yeah. Where he hands the lady the envelope and he's like, there's no one else. I just couldn't think of who else would do it. I didn't know who was going to save this stuff. So it was like, the turf was just an icon of Seattle. Absolutely. It was so yeah. important to the city. Oh, yeah. and, and the longer that we were here and, and doing this downtown and being uh, sort of like an integral part of downtown and embraced by the community, I started to feel a stronger sense of obligation to, to um, pay homage to the, uh, the heritage that, that is. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and certainly that sign, I mean, it's seen good times and bad times. It's the second iteration of the turf yeah. sign. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. And, uh, of course, the original one, the neon being in the Mohai, where, yep. where it rightly belongs. But yeah. this one, I, I got a call from a guy who owned uh, what became Ludie's. And, uh, he I remember that, please. Yeah. Where was that at? Bob, is that up in your neck? Is that at Pioneer Square? Okay, shout out that. I was just going to cut out that it's reopened on second steward night, but it was booty to sit over the church. Yeah. 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 Good call. And, and, uh, Moody's is there and they make fantastic sort of like American Filipino big breakfast things, which are pretty unique and cool. Yeah. Um, and, and that spot there was really neat. I mean, I, I, I just wanted to say the sign more than anything for the church yeah, sign. Yeah, yeah. It happened as like a badge of honor for the city. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people have seen that. The Brooklyn uh, the Brooklyn was, bar none, one of my favorite restaurants the city's ever produced. It was mm-hmm. just, it was really hard to disguise its quality with the simplicity that they were producing there. I mean, they, they you couldn't smother, you know, a, 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 a raw oyster with anything to make it taste better than a raw oyster. So yeah, they yeah. were really, they were, they were always doing that. And it, it's unfortunate because they were cutting it really close in the margins and they didn't make it past the, uh, the line of survival in the pandemic. And yeah. It was a heartbreak. I mean, my wife and actually cried. It was, uh, 
it was a family staple. We went there a lot. We took a lot of friends and relatives there, and we were proud patrons and uh, and absolutely proud neighbors. Yeah. And so when the opportunity came to pick up the sign, they actually called Mohai, and no one from Mohai wanted to present to collect the sign. And they promised to about six or eight times, and finally the building was going to demolish it. And I got a call from the maintenance crew who all drink here. Uh-huh. And uh, they said, uh, like, save this sign. Maybe and, you can do some of our light work and take this sign. Uh, yeah, now it was a little bit like that. I mean, well, it like, fits perfect in here, too. I mean, it's, yeah, it's great. Well, I wanted, it, I wanted to create this room and sort of rebrand it as, as, uh, as, as the Brooklyn Mile. And yeah. Because that place was, I think, really important, firstly, to the heritage of the city. I mean, where the hell do you find a chop house now? Yeah, right. yeah, and, yeah. And, exactly, and, yeah. And that, that's the way we live for a long time in this city. And do you know, uh, do you know John Bennett down in Georgetown? He owns the uh, Luna Cafe and many others. I was just going to say. I, do know, I don't know. There's some. Because he's, a, he's very similar. He's he's also has, like, saved a lot of signs, kind of like what you did. There's some amazing yeah. signs down in Georgetown. He's Even, got the yeah. Buckaroo Tavern. And, oh, yep, Buckaroo. The original Buckaroo Tavern. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's down in Georgetown. It's the only Georgetown Stables, and it's like a historic museum going down there. Fantastic. So, but anyway, it's very similar to kind of like your your philosophy. It's almost yeah. turning into Museum Row down in Georgetown for sure. Yeah, there's so much yeah. lore and so Thanks much history John. down there. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're looking around. It's like um, we're all looking around for our history, like it's a lost object. You know, it's yeah. like. They, Seattle's never been a city that allows history to stand in the way of progress. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. Tear down and Paul build Shell. something new. Yeah. Paul Shell. We yeah. had the honor of meeting yeah. as he rolls his eyes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah anyway. Nice. Say, um, well, God bless you. Thank you for keeping then, keeping them alive. We were also going over the history about how there used to be a laundromat here that sold moonshine, acted as a front, and it sounds like you... Uncovered like some old crates. Was yeah, that you? So it was actually me, and, and a very weird thing happened, which was that we noticed that the back storeroom was kind of like this weird shape, and we're like, oh, it's probably because maybe part of the hill, or I don't, you know, because there's like kind of this weird room behind that, what we used to call the men's room, which is now just the restroom. And uh, it, it was um, this kind of like weird area where the wall was kind of at an angle. All right. And uh, we were replacing the urinal in that restroom. And if you look in there now, you'll notice the ceiling's kind of at an angle. So, I was like, yeah. why the hell is that? Yeah, it's weird. Well, it's because it was a stairway that was just being hidden by this fake monument. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Oh, wow. And so when we opened it up, we found this room. And it was kind of like there's a bunch of bottles that I still have upstairs. And, like, That's crazy. And moonshine shit and all of it. Oh, yeah, wow. It was wild. And I talked to the old man, uh, Earl, Earl Diller, who encouraged me to open the room. And uh, he said, I said, well, why don't we just expose some of the brick? He goes, oh, no, my father... My father went and got workmen from China, and he broke up in that wall, and it's not good looking, you know, just did a job because he had to do what he had to do. Sure. And he didn't explain more than that, but man, it became very <laughs> clear <laughs> oh, when I opened that wall. <laughs> okay. yeah. and, and so we created this... Read uh, between the bricks. You know, yeah. And for a while, it was open as our as our VIP slash uh, lower lounge room there, and it's still there. It's actually, we started, for better or worse, started to renovate it during uh, Feb... January and February, just before the shutdown with COVID. Mm, and okay. so it's kind of remained like that. We got as far as putting in a Marvel 4. And uh, this nice. year... Nice. Yeah, it's pretty good. And this year for our 130th anniversary, we're going to reopen it as a uh, as a little bit of a, a whiskey lounge, like more old school. Oh, I nice. love that. I and love where is that. it? It's right behind us. Right oh, you go through yeah. Yeah, yeah. there? So I'll walk you guys down there afterwards. Cool. It's really That's wild, cool. but yeah. I'd love to see it. And uh, we found an old staircase. Like, you know how they used to have, like, those old, like, kind of rubber coating on the stairs back in the old Yeah, days? yeah, yeah, yeah. Really rubber, but, like, no but to keep your traction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like your grandma's house. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> it's like, uh, don't slip. And Along then, with and, the uh, plastic-covered couches. Uh, and it was, yeah, exactly. It was, but it was wild. Fuzzy right? toilet seat covers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Jesus. Well, okay, maybe not that. <laughs> you should bring those back. Put those in the restroom. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. Be an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> no, we uh, we actually had a um, yeah. It was it was just it was shocking discovery. We were just shocked to find it. Then we fixed it up. I I took a bunch of cherry paneling, 
and I aged in the sun for about uh, six weeks. Like I kept rotating it through my backyard, and the neighbors all thought I was nuts. But I was trying to get it to age and become yeah. more darker red. Sure. So I stuck that in there. It was beautiful. Yeah. And then we were doing a staff training here, and this old lady friend came in out of nowhere. I can't make this up. There's a video on YouTube right now if you look it up. She was like a hundred and something years old and she told us the whole story of it. No oh, shit, really? Oh, wow. wow. And she's like, oh yeah, no, there's this guy, Bob, and he ran this thing. And she just told us it. Uh, and wow. she said that she actually brought her grandfather's shirts to that Chinese laundry. Wow. And they Kid. lost him a bunch of times. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. Well, the yeah. shirts were not their priority. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess, but yeah, she said that it was just like this whole street was different. And well, and that's awesome, and, and Jeremy touched on this earlier, but you know, we've been to a lot of different historic drinking establishments and dive bars, and we've met a lot of owners like you that also saw this neighborhood bar that's been around for decades and was at the threat of closing whatever and saw what was at stake. They realized the historic importance of the place, what it meant to the community, how long it's been around, and they embraced it, and they came in and you know bought it just like you did this place. And what it's going to take. Our, what and what gonna it's going to take, yeah. and are just carrying it and, and carry that responsibility very much on their shoulders yeah. in a really important way. Yeah. So we applaud people like you, and you. it's also always and awesome to talk that's to people like you. Yeah, that's what we're here. Yeah, all yeah. My fellow yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. And bartenders, God bless you all. You are fighting the good fight, and we yeah. need to keep this thing going because Seattle. Need you. Uh, your city needs you, and your community needs you. A hundred percent. That's yeah. true, and very well Drinking said. Drinking slobs like us need you too. Yeah. <laughs> but that was well, the core thing. The when yeah. I came down here to introduce myself and meet you, I came down at three, and they said, "Oh, come back at five. Totally different place at five. It was shoulder to shoulder. It was packed. It was loud. The people were loud. I had to turn up the music. Then the people got louder, and the music got louder. It was like." And every Avout. God bless America. You know, Avout Vandermeer, he knows shorties. He was a guy who did Jules Mays refurbishment. Yeah. He owns the mayor. And uh, he's always saying, like, I'm sick of people from fucking Maple Valley saying, oh, downtown's dead. Because yeah, no, it's yeah, not. No, yeah. Not at all. Not here. Your pizza not. place no, in no. Maple Valley's yeah. doing fine. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Surprise, people in the suburbs are really content staying in the suburban <laughs> bubble. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that's what the. This reminded me of when I came in for happy hour. I was like, "This is a hopping yeah, yeah. downtown yeah. bar." We're definitely I mean, it's we're a scene. The part of nine eight one zero one. I'm very proud of that. Yep, yep. Uh, we're that's uh, you know next like, like the next thing we're gonna do with this is like for the more cocktail products. We do a lot of craft cocktails. The little wine bar next door. We're actually converting it to the eighteen ninety four bar. Oh, very cool. Oh. Bit more upscale, but still with the with the roots. Whis- of whiskey the, uh, theme, always. always. <laughs> whiskey, whiskey, gin, and we're not going to shake off our uh, the, the Italian roots. My wife is uh, she's uh, first generation Italian. So a- Aperol and Cinzano. A lot of Cinzano, a lot of Aperol, and a lot of Campari, a lot of Amino, <laughs> a lot of the category that it's called Amari. Yeah, yeah. Spritzes are all the rage. Yeah, we do. We. God, we just put one on the menu called, you guys remember this, Cham- uh, Champagne Wishes. Remember uh, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Geez, yeah. 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 Robin Leach. Oh, yeah, that's right. Robin that's right. Leach. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Champagne <laughs> Wishes and Caviar Dreams. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That's in the Wayback Machine. Yeah, so nice. we got in the Wayback Machine. We got a, uh, there's these great kids from Italy, and they came up with this cool liquor called Italicus. And it tastes like it's you need, to, you need to spell that with the Metallica font. Oh, no, right? it's not Metallica's, but that's funny. No, it totally to needs to be in that same font. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and just wait to be sued. You know what? Actually, it would be kind of funny to have a drink in there and call it the Metallica's. Fuck that'd yeah, be, it would. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> but yeah, you, you just <laughs> count the minutes until you're sued. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, those Lars. Hello, this is Lars Ulrich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. coming to kill you. Yeah. Mars. Like, a, like a gallon of those to go. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> we're doing a, we're doing a uh, it's like a, a bit of a champagne spritz with that stuff. Oh, man. A bit of gin. Kind of a French. Count us in. We're back. Hundred. We're back here. Next it's episode. Blue. Very nice. It's kind of like a blue wine, except for a little bit of market, whatever. Mm, nice. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, Rob Wilson, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank amazing. you so Fantastic. much, man. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you Rob. It's going to be a good episode. Hell yeah. A lot of fun. Really a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. You guys are awesome. Thank yeah, and is, is there any shout-outs you want to give? Yeah, You've got totally. any big events coming up here? Anything you want to announce to the yeah, listeners? Yeah, so as always, um, you know, we're going to be at the Carnival of Cocktails this year um, representing uh, some Bruno Ricard brands. We do a lot of work. That, that uh, household fashion is actually our 1894, mm. and we hand-select uh, barrels from Jefferson Reserve Bourbon. So Jefferson's Bourbon in, uh, in Kentucky and and uh, so we're there pouring 1894 fashions, the whole carnival of cocktails. Okay. Oh, nice. uh, we're going to be pouring uh, Dillerum Sunsets made with that Metallicus, actually Italicus. And, okay. uh, Metallicus yeah. is going to be there is what you're saying. Metallicus yeah. 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 <laughs> coming to kill me. Yeah. yeah. Enter, the, enter the hitman. They, uh, they, um, yeah. And then we've got, uh, of course, our, our St. Patrick Day, affectionately known here as Jay McGettin. Jay McGettin. Nice. <laughs> oh, boy. We have a lot of Jameson shots. Sounds troublesome. Uh, yeah. So you got the big pack out the front waiting to get in the door on, on, uh, and you've got a on Amateur Jameson Night. And you've got a special release coming out in March, right? That's what it's for. We, do, yeah. we, have, a, we have a little barrel that we do. We jump it into a, um, a sinky keg, and we just pull it through the tap there for people who want a shot. But the big one... You can just tell all the customers that these are kegs that you age down in the cellar that was discovered under the laundromat of the speakeasy. Or the, <laughs> Some uh, yeah. mythology yeah. into it. Yeah. The, Absolutely. The poison, yeah. Uh, poison liquor there, from yeah, the old there, laundromat. There may, there may yeah. not be some ethyl alcohol in there. <laughs> we can't yeah. say. We actually switch the barrel. Which we actually do switch the barrel from all the way to the back storage to upstairs. And so we move that barrel... Um, Upstairs to the brothel, winter, yeah. To, okay, to right. Brothel, right? Yeah. And then we move it back downstairs during the summer. And in between, we let once it gets to about uh, 80 degrees outside because it gets really hot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We leave it up there for a couple of weeks, and then we bring it back down, and then it stays about 70 degrees where it's at. And so it maintains the temperature between like 85 and 60 degrees at all, like any time. No, and, nobody and, likes a hot whiskey. You know, and and. <laughs> For what it's worth, it turns out pretty good. Every year's a little different, to be honest. With yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of kind of cool. But, awesome, um, nice. Yeah. We'll come back. We'll be back in March. Hell yeah. yeah. Or, or come in April. We're having a hundred and thirtieth birthday party. There we go. That's oh, a big yeah. one. What is the, uh, April twenty seventh. April twenty seventh. April twenty seventh. That's uh, Saturday. We're having a big uh, big birthday bash. You guys are all invited. Come We'd down. love to be here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank it's you, Rob. Be a lot of fun. We're gonna pour out a lot of crazy whiskeys. Woo. I've got whiskeys I bought from the liquor board. Still in inventory from 2008. Oh wow! So nice. a bunch of that stuff. Just why not? Why not? Okay. <laughs> and Say Brad's no more. birthday yeah. is the day before, so uh, it's more also going to be your birthday party, Brad. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the celebration. All right. Oh my God, this is fantastic. So, Rob, thank you again. Thank you, guys. So, yeah, thank you so much. I think we're going to kind of wrap up this episode, and we had some fantastic times, some fa- fantastic drinks here at the Diller Room. So thanks everybody. Uh, like, subscribe, smash, and exit, or whatever the hell you do in the social medias. And we'll uh, talk to everybody next time. All right. Till next time. Cheers. Cheers. Yep. Thanks, guys.